Okay. I'm really excited to talk about portfolio management, how it accelerates your product and career. Based on the poll, we'll speak mostly about the prioritization, the negotiation of actually pairing objectives and OKRs. We'll touch upon moving up the ranks in a senior leadership role and how to think about your overall product strategy from a portfolio perspective. Um, quick introduction on the speakers today. So we have Becky and Jeanette, two experts in the product space. Becky built the portfolio management function at PayPal, BigCommerce, Shutterfly, and Feedseye. She launched Dragon Boat, which is an integrated road mapping and portfolio allocation platform to help product teams strategize, prioritize, deliver, and improve industry-leading products. Jeanette is a seasoned product executive, startup advisor, and investor in global fintech, payments, e-commerce, and marketplace companies. She's currently Chief Product Officer at Copper and has led products in startups, pre-IPO, and publicly traded companies. Okay, so with that, I'll pass it over to the two speakers to take it away. Hey, thanks, Baji, and good morning, good evening, good afternoon, anyone. I'm sure we have a global audience here. I'm very excited talking, meeting you. Um, wait, sorry, there's a something around the pool keep jumping up. So today we'll have a conversational chat around some of the topics that Baji highlighted earlier. Um, we will start with some of the career journeys and stories, but mostly around topics on product, building product, growing your career, prioritization, um, deliver business values, and uh, some of them around the stakeholder buy-ins, and, um, and we will um, probably take a little bit look on how portfolio management in action look like. So with that, we can get started. Again, we will make it a more conversational, so not so much around um, a decks and, and slides. So um, I think I'll probably uh, start with the Jeanette. So Jeanette and I actually met a long time ago. We worked at the PayPal, um, both sort, sort of early in our career. And um, I think that looking back, um, we definitely learned quite a few things. And, and looking back at our career, also see some of the learnings, not only our own experience, also experiences of the teams we build, um, members that we uh, partner with, as well as um, some of the PMs kind of not necessarily struggle, but um, get stuck somewhere uh, around their, their product journey. So um, Janelle, what, what do you think? Um, you want to share a little bit of uh, your experience and observation? Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Becky. Uh, we've known each other for more than a decade now. And uh, yeah, uh, like you said, intended to have this be a really interesting conversations that we share our observations. And uh, I want to highlight like uh, something that when we were at PayPal, I think we are probably more um, still like look an as, uh, aspiring product uh, uh, leads where we've been looking around how to uh, quote unquote climb the product leadership mountain. What are the typical advice we got from mentors were, oh, work on highly visible projects, get more exposure, try to present to the executive as much as you can. Now, uh, looking back, I, I felt like that those are all good advice, but actually there is a big chasm between uh, product managers and getting over that custom and become product executives that those advice did not address. It is the mentality. The mentality of, do you really just care about that project, the features, the experience, or actually you are trying to think uh, like the executive that you are talking to who care about business results. Right. And are you thinking about metrics like uh, adoption of my features, the conversion of the flow, or are you starting to worry about something bigger, something bigger about am I getting a lot of users into our product? Are we doing enough to re retain them through uh, solving their problems? 
and how how can we keep growing the user base how can we keep them longer so that we will be able to get more revenues from them and right. finally also one thing that i have um, realized which actually is a turning point for me um, was my relationship with uh, the stakeholders that i work with when i was a product lead i was more thinking about how can I collaborate with them to solve a very tangible business problems? But later on, when I become the DRI, uh, the direct responsible individual for a uh, com company objective, then I don't think like a product manager anymore because I'm responsible for a business objective, which is to increase the net revenue per user. I have to think like a general manager and I have to look at my relationship with my stakeholders very differently because we are helping each other to succeed so that we will be able to achieve the business result for the company. And it's not just about product anymore. It's about sometimes some initiative will be driven by sales, some will be driven by customer success, some will be driven by ops, but that's okay. I help them succeed, which in turn help the company succeed. And I think that's the uh, the chasm uh, that when I look back now, I started to um, mentor junior product manager this way, where they can think about how to focus on the business as opposed to just the product. Right. Yeah, I think you are really spot on. A lot of times when um, when we either getting trainings or talking to PMs, there's a strong focus on customer experience, how customer can be delighted, how a customer can have a better flow and faster sign on. I think those are really, really important foundations, but ultimately they are means to an end. I think that really is leading to some of the interesting, uh, not only the focus of the PMs on their skill sets, there's also translating to how they look at the quote unquote product roadmap, how they look at the, the things they need to focus on, and it started to use that to drive, for example, prioritization. So um, I think that um, I, I want to almost use an example of how you mentioned um, you know, how instead of looking at adoption conversion uh, versus uh, retention and acquisition look very similar, but it's a little different in ways how people uh, think about the roadmap. Do you want to, do you have a story to share around those space? Yeah, like typically uh, a product manager, the easiest way is to gather feedback from your user, user research team, your salespeople, your CS, you gather requests bottom up, and then you try to figure out, okay, what are the common themes of all these requests? And then you put together a roadmap. And uh, what I have noticed since I uh, become a DRI, then it's, uh, the, it's more about also how to combine the top-down view. The top-down view typically is three OKR defined by the CEO and co-founders. And the leadership team will have to agree on, hey, in order to achieve this OKR one, OKR two, OKR three, here are what we are going to do for different key results. And this is the time when a product executive will be very active in terms of understanding, negotiating with all the stakeholders and really look at everyone's requests and think hard is, do they depend on product to achieve those uh, key results? And if so, uh, play a very active uh, role in shaping the scope of how that could be and have a more realistic uh, key results that they will own 
because of what uh, product and eng can, can deliver. And therefore, as you can see, this is an iterative process. Right. Um, all the executive will roll out their wish list of uh, key results initially based on the three OKRs of the company for that quarter, for example. Okay. And then uh, product will actively engage with uh, each executive. And back and forth based on the resources uh, that we have and what results will have to be calibrated because of that, and then have another round of key results that becomes more realistic. And because of this process, the stakeholders are counting on product and engineers to deliver those uh, key results. And therefore being able to have a way to calculate uh, the resources and allocate to uh, each of the key initiatives that are owned by uh, all stakeholders across the company is very important because right. this has to work. If this doesn't work in one quarter, then next quarter, st stockholder, other stakeholders are starting to question, well, you, did, you said you could deliver that and last quarter you did not. And what, what should I put on my key results this quarter? Uh, is that, uh, uh, will, will we be able to deliver? So you, this type of conversations is, uh, have, in order to maintain the trust, uh, being able to deliver is very important. Right, and, and you, you have touched upon so many topics. I'm gonna break it up into a couple deeper, like double click on some of the deeper um, uh, 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 examples. So when you first, uh, first part of you mentioned, it's something that we're very typically see today uh, in a product roadmap, quote unquote, and that, that's something you mentioned is the bottoms up, right? You have some of features and then you have prioritization here and using whatever scoring system, the rise and R, whatever you use, right? And, and then you also have some sort of engineer resource uh, associated with this. It's a very interesting when uh, in earlier in our career, we look at this, we think this is it's a pretty good uh, mechanism, right? It's a, it's a data driven, it's a quantified, and you have also have a really good product engineering collaboration. I wanna call out something that you mentioned earlier about how it's an iterative process and that sort of feel like the step one, right? You get the features or customer request and then you prioritize them and then you work with the engineering, you get a teacher sizing or some sort of a high level effort say, hey, this is the most important thing. We are, uh, this is the effort we have and then we can, uh, we can only do this much. And that back in the days, it feel like it's a good process, right? But uh, you also mentioned this is a bottoms up uh, approach, which, you know, later on in our career, we realized, hey, this is actually a, a very seriously flawed exercise. And because it didn't have the top down approach, right? And that's sort of the part you mentioned um, from a, a top down perspective, when you're really looking at these features, what we saw earlier is there are key elements that's missing. That's like from a feature versus a business outcome, right? So how, how these features actually potentially in affect the business outcome. And that's sort of like a, the, we, we still going down from a bottom up and then we're missing things. Is this something that uh, you're referring to? Yep, absolutely. And, and uh, this, yep, go ahead. So that, and the, the solution, uh, you mentioned a little bit of the top down, maybe let's talk about this uh, a little bit more on um, how, how that would potentially look. I think that's one of the example, you know, you share with me um, when you, when we first talk, let's uh, maybe uh, almost like a six month ago after our PayPal days. And when, when I was talking to you about running, you know, product organizations as product leader for startups. And I think that's the time we reconnected and you, you say, Hey, you know, um, we, we, we're startup, but we still need a, a portfolio approach and and when we connected you say help this is this is exactly the top down and bottoms up approach that you're building in your toy dragon was want to hear from you 
How do you think about top down, bottoms up, and how that's all coming together? Yeah, and just like you see on this、uh, screen, is a very nice、uh, graphic representation of what we are talking about. You, as you can see on the left. Um, you, there are three objectives that kind of like what I was、uh, talking about. There are like three company objectives. Typically, depending on the stage of the company, it can be a user growth goal. It could be a revenue growth、uh, growth goal. It could be something relating to、uh, compliance in our industry. And typically, these three goals are what the company needs to achieve. And by achieving these objectives. Uh, the company would be ready for the next milestone. Let's say twelve months later, and therefore all the everyone in the company should rally towards、uh, these objectives, knowing that these are the objectives that will bring the company to the next milestone. And as a result, it's very clear uh, for uh, each department to each、uh, functional group to think about: okay, what can I do? Uh, in my day to day, that I can、uh, contribute to this, whether it's a user growth、uh, goal or revenue growth goal, and like like the the good thing is that the、uh, executive team can also agree on. Hey, there are three goals, but we can decide that、uh, we will allocate engineering resources equally, or we can say, you know, for this quarter, user growth is more in top important for us. Next. Quarter, we can focus on revenue growth. So let's say in this quarter, we will spend fifty percent of our engineering resources for user growth,、um, and then only thirty、uh, percent on、uh, revenue growth. So a tool like that, as you can see on the right side, where you can actually have a target allocation for each of the objectives. And over the time, whether it's a monthly cadence or a weekly cadence, you can start to see whether you are on track or off track、uh, in terms of allocating your resources to these、uh, different objectives. Because each object,、uh, each quarter, let's say you know, if this quarter I am supposed to、uh, make sure I. Invest heavily on user growth, but、uh, but, but end up what happened was、uh, I overdo on、uh, compliance. Then I need to have this conversation、uh, with the stakeholders to discuss. I think we probably have to、uh, either change the priorities of our projects in the remaining of the quarter, or otherwise、uh, we are not、uh, saying what we are, are supposed to do. Or we just less align, less you know, change our、uh, allocation、uh, in the middle of the quarter, so that、uh, we are we everyone is clear the new target, and therefore product and、uh, engineering organizations are offering full transparencies on what we are delivering. Right. I think there are so many very very interesting tidbits that you are saying. I want to call out. The first tidbit that you have here is that taking a portfolio approach, where most people think about portfolio, say, "Oh, I have, you know, it's a, it's a product portfolio, right?" Everyone think about portfolio, always think about product portfolio. Say, "Hey, I'm just a one company. I'm just one product manager. Why I don't have a portfolio?" Right, and I think that's a, it's a very limiting context on going back to earlier on saying how product manager think versus how product executive think is that if you're a product manager, you think about features, you think about user experience, it's very easy to think about product portfolio context. Saying I have five products, so that's a portfolio. Where when you become a product executive, you actually more focus on business outcome. So you take a portfolio approach, not necessarily to five product lines within your area. You're actually looking at these three business outcomes you need to drive, and then you use a portfolio approach to actually allocate the outcome, not necessarily allocate to the work itself in the first place. Yeah, yeah, you you are absolutely right,、uh, Becky. Um, at the beginning of my career, probably my roadmap is more.、Uh, the themes are more around products, what we call product centric, and then、uh, 
I lately I've noticed that you know my roadmap is more OKR centric. In a, a, just like the, the how you described it, because we need to make sure that we are investing uh, in the to drive the right business outcome. Right. So one of the very interesting thing uh, I had with uh, another uh, chief product officer recently is that uh, maybe we can talk about later on, on how you like negotiate different stakeholders, different outcome as well. In that. Um, how do you engage your stakeholder in the conversation when you talk about product-centric roadmap portfolio? It's all, it feels like the burden is on the, the product leader, right? Because that's your product roadmap. You have five product themes and then you decide. It doesn't translate to your stakeholders' goals or, 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 or alignment on their focus, right? When you, when you switch around uh, to a a, a outcome focus that all of a sudden you start to align with your stakeholders on the same thing they care about, right? Yeah, Google absolutely. Revenue, like people care about Google revenue. It's not like the product theme is onboarding. That's a very diff different to translate to grow revenue, for example. But if you say, hey, I look at, at the grow revenue as a goal, that onboarding or elements of onboarding can easily tie to it, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. And I also want to point out a disadvantage of a product centric uh, roadmap is that it's very hard for uh, product managers to think out of the box. They, in, in, in other words, they were just uh, probably stuck by, okay, I have to, this is the requirement from my stakeholder. I have to just think about this onboarding flow, what I can do about it. But if you focus on the problem as opposed to the product, then uh, when time is needed, we can, Becky, we can talk about like, you know, how often at the end of the quarter, we felt like we cannot deliver. And therefore, you know, we have to start to have the conversation of uh, the scoping or, uh, or make things uh, simpler for, for our stakeholder. Then this is the time when if you can focus on the problem, then you will suddenly open your eyes to a lot of creative solutions. Some could be product, some could be really just a manual workflow. As long as there is a way to support the experience where the stakeholder can still achieve, for example, you know, sign up uh, for big teams, you could think about maybe just putting a Google form. Um, and then figure out how to, for example, run a script at the back end uh, to, to uh, achieve some onboarding requirement, at least at the beginning, to keep that key results at least started, keep the learning started. And then think about how to productize it later. Right, right. And it's, uh, it is really, really cool to think about how Focusing on an outcome gave us a different ability to look at the problem, right? Otherwise, looking at the product, then we it's true, it's so limiting on, you know, we got to improve certain things versus what we're trying to achieve. I wouldn't play a devil's advocate for a second, because I think that happened uh, in companies often as well, is that the product roadmap, quote unquote, are so much driven on the business goals that are mostly near term. You know, you know, conversions and revenues. So, so then the company just quote unquote optimize for these near term focuses. Then you don't build for the future. Then ultimately, company kind of fail on their own success, right? There are so many companies having that. Um, I, I would love to hear from you uh, how how you handle that as a product leader. That some of the things may not give you any of these benefit this quarter. Um, how do you make sure it's still build so that the product would have future benefits, even though maybe not today? Good question, Becky. Uh, that's why quarterly planning is more quarter by quarter, but there is uh, still um, an additional annual planning process that has to happen. And this annual planning process should be more uh, vision driven, like think, really think about uh, why is the company here? What are we trying to do? How do we think we will be 
uh, playing in the market a year from now, 18 months from now, or even a little further, meaning the annual planning exercise has to be tied to more the company long-term strategy, the company vision in the long-term. And as a product executive, also need to think about uh, based on that long-term strategy, what does that mean for products? What, what are the product strategy that needs to happen uh, quarter by quarter to ultimately make sure that we pave the way for that long-term vision? And therefore, sometimes like in, the, in addition to the three objectives for the quarter uh, that we need to deliver, I also will put another uh, objective that is more for the long-term vision. And I will reserve, let's say, 10% of the engineering resources. And I'm not, I'm trying not to let people eat it up because um, I would align with the stakeholder saying that, hey, this is the 10% capacity that we need to pave the way for our long-term goal. And we should try to protect that and really think about how to optimize uh, the remaining resources for the quarterly goals uh, based on the bucket and try to think about if needed, how to add more resources into those buckets as opposed to completely putting uh, the long-term uh, vision aside. Yeah, I, I think you brought up something very interesting. One is the annual planning and align executive, both on things we need to achieve as well as longer term product vision. And I want to double click on this. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of myth around annual planning. And if people feel like this is a very waterfall, it's long time. Why you need to plan a year? You can see a year ahead, your startup company. And, and so maybe we can just spend a little bit of time on uh, annual planning, uh, why, is, why you think it's important? How is it done effectively versus how it's done not effectively? And, and, and then maybe we can spend a little bit of time if, if you have a story uh, and it would be great to hear. Yeah, uh, so first of all, the annual planning ideally should be um, in a more off-site scenario where the executive um, are able to uh, have a, a, a more extended period of time to discuss through and bring, brainstorm through how the company would look like uh, one to three years ahead from now. And really think about, like, for example, if we said that we want to be, um, we want to, we want to uh, be able to uh, disrupt a particular industry, then the question is, uh, how? Is it by automation? Is it by connecting supply and demand? Is it by becoming, uh, managing uh, the user's money, income and outcome and everything in one place, help them to uh, play like a big guy, even though they are just a small contractor. Like the how part, um, is really something that uh, will take a longer time to be able to build, but at least how to get there, the executive list needs to align. And once a, a, a particular path uh, is chosen, then you start to think about, okay, so if uh, just like, you know, doing a map from A to B, if I want to, if this is B, I want to get to, and here we are A, there are different ways to get there. Then the executive needs to discuss, okay, which path seems to help us get there sooner? Is it about um, uh, deepening the uh, engagement with supply first, or is it about engaging partner for demand first? Like all these different paths, we need to be very uh, clear because uh, often they all needs to be done, but the sequence uh, could be different and the executive needs to align because these uh, planning will drive down to, okay, Q1, I should focus on this. 
Q2, I should focus on that. Based on, you know, just like we are driving the, the navigation will tell us uh, where we need to go first. Right. And what is uh, next. Right. I think you brought out something so interesting. You know, personally, I've done a lot of uh, uh, strategic planning, we call it, right, at, on an annual basis. And what what's when you done well, you identify so many of the misalignments in a company. I can almost share an example similar to yours is that, you know, I joined this company. Um, the first year we did a, a strategic planning that it was never done before. And um, we basically say, hey, if we want to double our revenue, how are we gonna go about doing this? So we did a pause, for example, we did a little quick survey in the room. Everyone write down from a you know, VP of sales to VP of marketing to uh, head of business development and pro like three product VPs and CEOs and so forth. And after we did like a five minutes sharing of what, uh, how we double revenue, and then we open up our paper, Re everyone has different opinions that, you know, BD said we need to go channels, and then we need to, you know, why label our product, and the head of sales say we need to go to these countries, and product say we're going to build this, you know, new machine learning models, like everyone has different ideas, and that became something so important. If we don't do this alignment, then, you know, there's, uh, you know, these different strategies will be carried out by different functions, because from a leader perspective. So executives already are the ones that having the most context than anyone else in the company, right? But even because their function, they actually have a different idea for how to go about doing that. If we didn't do the exercise, which that happened in the past, you have all this misalignment that the BD wants to do this, the sales want to do this, and they all come to product and the product has a different idea. So the roadmap is just a mess, right? Once we have yeah. the price, we align on, like you said, right? We are going to do there. It's, it's a sequence. We're going to, you know, you know, 80% doubled on our core market. We're going to spend 20% to do some innovation. And then it, it not only we just align product roadmap and strategy, we also align on the go-to-market side, what sales is going to do to support that 20, 80% so they can achieve the revenue, how marketing needs to do to take things to market. And that is a, such a high level alignment, not alignment on what to do in the feature or roadmap perspective, but really align on how the strategy is going to play out across all teams so that at least directionally, are we flying or we take a train, right? So that's basically what we're trying to do in here, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, this alignment sometimes could be uh, difficult conversations. And it's not even product related. It's like, if I, if I want to focus on the core market for in Q1, but I will focus on the international market in Q2, then uh, someone is going to be unhappy about it in Q1. But at least that conversation needs to be aligned. And we have to, uh, we understand that why this is the best decisions for the company, given the milestones ahead of us. And then it's really just, you know, a matter of uh, uh, trusting that uh, we will be able to uh, play a role or we can, you know, even in this quarter, uh, my function might not be the key focus yet, but I can still be doing things. I can still think about, okay, what do I need to do in order to uh, support this, let's say, you know, um, sales uh, target because we know that you know this is a user this quarter is about user growth how can what can we do to support uh, uh, this goal even though I'm not a, a, a sales team and then we can let's say you know in the next quarter have a revenue grow that you know take a higher percentage of allocation and then at that time um, everyone will also be helping with this uh, revenue growth by having like different type of uh, initiatives and even salespeople will be helping as well. Right. And you mentioned something that are, are very important. I want to double click on that, which is the trust. It's, a, it's a very interesting when you lay out the direction we want to go and share that direction. We want to go and give your team what they need to to have to achieve that, right? The allocation resources, obviously, and visibility on where we're going, the trust will be automatically be in instilled. When you don't have that, you tell people say, 
we're gonna work on X, Y, Z. And then there's no trust the people from a different level. So I'll have to dive down to the detail to see exactly what's going on because it wasn't clear what, why we work on this one, why we don't work on the other one. Like it seems seem all important, but if you lay out say, here's a high, high level, we're gonna work on Q1, for example, like you said, to focus on the, 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 the revenue. And then the second quarter will be focusing on innovation and expansion. And all of a sudden that people don't feel like they, they left out. There is a, it, it's, there is a, it's a path to cover various needs there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's where the alignment needs to happen. Um, and sometimes uh, when we focus uh, new features, for example, to help uh, sales to acquire larger team, then uh, what it means is that we will have, uh, we might not have resources to cover some of the critical ask from customer success. They are spending a lot of time manually uh, doing certain operations. Uh, that part is more so about like us, you know, saving um, uh, the CS time. We understand that it is important. It is not completely clear that it doesn't translate to the OKR directly, but I will work with uh, the head of CS to come up with uh, reasons. Hey, you know, like by freeing up 40 hours of the CS team, now the CS will be able to uh, actually help uh, cross-selling. And therefore uh, we will be able to support this uh, uh, OKR of uh, Use, user growth as well. And, um, and, and therefore, uh, like really let the stakeholder understand that I am helping them to succeed. I am helping them to achieve their goals. And sometimes it might mean um, if I have the resources, that would be great. If I don't, I have to lay out, I have to do some scenario planning. Like, okay, this is option A. Option A is that I have a fixed size of um, resources. And if that's the case, uh, these are the things that I can do. Um, and your project is probably under the line. Um, but if, um, if uh, I, I try, I probably can figure out how I can de-scope you know, uh, one more other projects in order to at least make some progress on your project. Or I can have another scenario where hey, assuming that I really want to do both projects, um, here will be the additional resources that we need to hire by what time. Let's go and talk to CTO. Let's explain the, why this is important that this needs to be done in this quarter. And let's see what we can do to hopefully get some resources in time. On, on board them and they will be able to uh, do this uh, particular function for you in this quarter. Really have that um, scenario planning, lay out two options, assuming resource is fixed pie versus uh, resources and expandable pie and facilitate that conversations and, and make uh, trade off decisions that everyone feel more comfortable. Right. And, and I think that's just a really, really cool conversation. Just want to kind of tie that together a little bit in that um, it's a very interesting, you know, in the, in the past, in the early days of product management, there's a big focus on being a product manager. Don't be a project manager. And there's someone manage your project. Don't need to worry about the timeline. Don't need to worry about resources. Just make sure you build the customer experience. When you become a product leader, all of a sudden you actually have to worry about all of those, right? You need to worry about, are we building the right goals? And do we allocate things to the right places? And then obviously prioritize negotiation. And then you actually talk quite a bit about resources and delivery and the commitment. So um, I just wanna kind of going back to this as on, how do you see that change happen? Why is it important for product leaders to not only concern about the features prioritization, also concern about the delivery and, and it feels like a program project management kind of activity? Yeah, it goes back to how I noticed that my relationship with my stakeholders are allies. 
we are helping each other to succeed. And therefore, if I start to felt like I might not be able to deliver, I need to think proactively. What are the other ways that we could still um, help the stakeholder deliver the key results that they committed for 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 the uh, for the quarter? And in other words, uh, I want to be in a position that um, I am not just about. Uh, hey, you know, I am a subcontractor. You gave me this job. I tell you that I can do it in three months. I'm sorry. It looks like it needs to take four months and it looks like, you know, it will take more time. It's just more complicated than we thought. You know, all these stories that you heard about when you try to, you know, engage with a remodeling contractor, right? Um, and we noticed that, you know, even based on our personal experience, uh, a better contractor, probably number one, they are better at, estimating the ETA for you, and also uh, have better communication with you uh, if things have changed. And most importantly, be really proactive, being a problem solver, um, to think about what are the key decisions that you uh, that needs to uh, be made in order to make sure that uh, the uh, what what they promised that they would deliver to you will 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 be delivered uh, as much as possible. So so we all had that experience, and we want to be uh, that type of ally for 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 our uh, stakeholders as well. That's awesome! So cool! Um, wow, time flies. I know we're coming towards the end of it. So I'm gonna just leave some time to uh, to some audience questions. Maybe you have time to take one or two of them. Sure. Baji, you want to take away? Thank you both so much. That was really, really interesting and engaging. I love the conversations around specific experiences you've had when managing stakeholders, negotiating resources, identifying dependencies, and really kind of transforming the way that you think about how you build the plan from focusing on product to focusing on OKRs. So we've had a few questions come in and please feel free to continue submitting them as we kick this off. So the first one is around getting started. So how do I implement a portfolio approach within my company? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think, I think first of all, uh, you 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 probably are already starting to uh, think about um, what it means to implement uh, portfolio management at your company. You start to probably look at the board, the blogs, and uh, uh, what thought leaders talked about how they prioritize roadmap, and then you start to uh, figure out you probably should um, start small, right? We have. Uh, uh, MVP in the product management area. And likewise, if we want to Im uh, implement a new way of uh, doing things, it's always uh, good to uh, start uh, small. And most importantly, uh, think about how, how you might be able to use a tool uh, that comes with a good workflow. And uh, this is also an advice uh, for, for the fact that I, I was an ex-consultant where typically we felt like if you want to align so many different uh, functions to do things in a certain way, sometimes uh, it, the easiest way is just to uh, find a tool that already have the best practice baked in the workflow. And then you have uh, some pilot and then you get buy-in from, from stakeholders and then you roll it out to the whole organization. Right, I, I think that's uh, really spot on in finding resources and then don't be the one you, you don't need to be the only one that sort of trying to push a big mountain, make the huge change of organization, right? So the, the resources as webinars and, and the community can also be 
sort of sounding board saying this is the best practice and we should be outcome focused organization. We should look at our product instead of, of themes and features only. That is another way we need to focus on the product. But when we talk to our stakeholders, we do need to look at the business as a whole. So, at, you know, obviously I think having resources and starting small and piloting rollouts is definitely the way to go. Do you have any recommendations on resources that people can leverage to become more familiar with this concept? Yeah, uh, the concept of OKR is really common in startups now, and I am seeing more big companies uh, implementing OKR as well. Uh, uh, Dragon Ball is a good tool that kind of uh, can let you do both uh, top down and bottom up in the sense that you can set up uh, OKRs and then at the same time, you can also uh, use the tool to collect uh, requests from different stakeholders. And then you can think about, okay, how can these uh, requests from all different places uh, ma uh, match with uh, the o OKRs and how can I prioritize uh, based on everything that we talked about um, in terms of uh, the resources needed in order to move the needle on a particular KR. And then also if I am to uh, allocate my engineering resources to box certain uh, investments, how can I make sure that I get the biggest uh, bang of the boat? We just got another great question around OKRs. So if there aren't currently OKRs within the company, how do you suggest somebody kind of bring that forth and implement, suggest the implementation company-wide from a product perspective? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I would assume that for companies that are not using OKR yet, the executives are probably still talking about our annual goals, our quarterly goals. And the question is how to uh, I put a number around it. And if you don't know, then this is a, a great question that will show that you think like a leader. And you can talk to your manager, talk to your skip level. Hey, I noticed that, you know, we talked about uh, um, globalization uh, in the all hands. Uh, what, what, what exactly we try to achieve uh, in this quarter? What, what, exa what, what does success look like uh, a year from now? Really try to uh, make that go more concrete in terms of like how the company are going to get there. Even brainstorm, even brainstorm how your particular uh, domain can contribute to that goal, come up with these ideas and get reactions uh, from your uh, executives. I, I bet it is going to be a really productive uh, conversations that can enlighten your executives. Right. I, I totally echo on that. Every company has goals. It's just that it may not be very clearly linked and then measured to product team and also other functional teams day to day. So having that connection of goals and what, how we get there and how we measure our success, it is a great way to elevate yourself in your organization and think strategically and think like a leader that helps you to you know, not only grow your skill and also grow your career.